that's what she does to me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer first. Let's get that done. And we'll pray. Pray for God's blessing in your life. Pray for uh, whatever's been bothering and ailing you. And then uh, I'm going to talk about some very important subjects today relating to personal your personal relationship with God through the eyes of Jeremiah the prophet. So if you have your Bible with you, look up the, the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament, and especially chapter 2. That's we're going to look into. Uh, Jeremiah's ministry as it relates to people reaching out to God and how God blesses those that re actually reach out to Him. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this day. Um, once again, we just thank you for all blessings you've given us. Every blessing that even the ones that we miss that we not are cognizant of, we thank you for. We pray that you will bless this word this evening, that it will edify, strengthen, and remind us of your grace and your mercy and forgiveness. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all ble all blessings and teachings. But most of all, Lord, we reach out to those that are lost, that don't know the word, that don't know about you or your spirit or your grace or forgiveness or the cross. And we pray especially for those people that will listen, that you will save them, that you will bless them, open up their hearts and minds to receive this teaching and how important it is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And uh, we just thank you in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 2 this evening and we're going to look at some things that hopefully that will you will take with you. We got through studying the armor of God, and we're going to come back to that next week, Lord willing, as far as wrapping it up and how useful the armor of God is, not only in war, but when you witness. This evening, I want to introduce you to the prophet Jeremiah. He's one of the major prophets of the Old Testament. The book of Jeremiah is one of the bigger books of the Old Testament. And let me give you a little background of Jeremiah, if you don't already know. For some that do know, he is known as the weeping prophet. Many people look at this as a sign of weakness, when it really isn't. Jeremiah was so full of compassion and love for the nation of Israel that he would actually cry when he prayed for the nation of Israel. Have you ever cried when you pray sometimes? Yes. Especially if it's a petition near your heart, like maybe a sick loved one or a friend in need something that really grips your heart and you end up crying when you pray. Jesus cried tears of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, if you remember, <coughs> before his uh, betrayal, crucifixion, and resurrection. He cried tears of blood. And if you read in John 17, when he cried those tears of blood, he was crying over the people of Israel. And he was crying for all those people that would eventually believe and trust in him as Lord and Savior. He prayed for his disciples. He prayed for his church. He prayed for those future believers that would come into the fold, that he would, that they would not only believe but act upon their faith. Jeremiah was very much the same way that he cried for the nation of Israel, and that he had so much love for the nation of Israel that he devoted almost his entire life to the ministry of preaching the gospel, preaching the word to the nation of Israel. We're going to look at Jeremiah chapter 2 this evening. We're going to focus on two verses, verses, verse 13 and verse 19. 629 B.C., 629 years before the birth of Christ, Jeremiah prophesied what some would call is a conversion message. Conversion is a big word. All it means simply is you must believe. And he says here, as I move up here, to verse 11, Jeremiah 2, 11, Hath the nation changed their gods, who are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. But the nation of Israel, during this time, was at a crossroads. If you go back in the Bible to Nehemiah and and Job, and if you look especially back to Joshua and 
and all those of the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was on good ground for, for the most part. But the nation of Israel started to, to steer away from God's word and God's commandment because of the times they were in. Now you're probably thinking, what went on in 629 B.C.? Well, let's look at some of the things that went on in 629 B.C. Number one, idolatry was rampant. Idolatry was growing in the nation of Israel. They were worshiping and bowing down to idols more than ever before in Israel's history. Even during the time of Moses and Joshua and kings like Josiah, the nation of Israel was beginning to, to go away from God's word and beginning to go toward the worshiping of idols. And part of the reason they were worshiping idols more was because of the religion or religions that was invading the nation of Israel. Now you're probably saying, well, what religions could there be that would lead to worship idols? Satanism, witchcraft. You're talking about uh, satanic religions that focus on the worship of demons. Okay. Sa Satanism was running rapid because of other nations that brought that, that introduced Israel into that. I look at Israel and I see the United States of America and we're parallel, we're, we're coincide with each other. And you're probably thinking, well, well, how, well how so? How, do you, how can you prove that? Well, here's why. Nation is God, uh, the nation of Israel is God's chosen nation. Amen? The United States of America was also chosen by God to be one nation under God, right? The nation of Israel became a state, finally a recognized state in 1948. America won its independence in 17, what, 76. If you look very closely, the nation of Israel fought and battled many years to be recognized as a nation, right? If you look at the United States of America, we went through World War with who? Great Britain. And we won our independence through that great war, led by George Washington, who became our first president, to win this war of our freedom. We won our freedom from Great Britain, from their tyranny. And one of the reasons why we went to war with Great Britain was because we did not want to be involved in their religious practices, right? It was called the Church of England. Where did the Church of England come from? It came from the Roman Catholic Church. Back then, our forefathers says we will not be dominated, we will not be controlled by any foreign religion. Our forefathers back then, John Hancock, Benjamin Franklin, uh, and so on, were godly men. These were men that knew the Bible and these were men that not only knew God but they feared God. And they wanted a nation to trust in the one true living God, right? So the only way that they would do that was to have a declaration of independence stating that we were one nation under God. And that is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible. Our forefathers then that wrote the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and so on, they knew how important it was for the Bible to be a main staple in our laws, in our dictates, in our Constitution. Okay? The nation of Israel was given a very special document. Who, who can... And I need to get more yogurt coupons. I mean to do that. What was Israel's law based on? Can anyone answer that? I'll give you a hint. It's found in the book of Exodus. It's found in the book, excuse me. Yeah, it's found in the book of Exodus. It was given to Moses. God says, I'm going to give you these very special laws for the nation of Israel to follow. And everything that you built on is going to be built on these ten laws. What are they called? The Ten Commandments. Very interesting, right? The Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, where were they based on? The Bible. That is why every president, with the exception of the last one we had, they put their hand on the Bible and they swear their oath to defend the Constitution and the Word of God in this land. Jeremiah knew the history of Israel and they knew the rich legacy of how the Ten Commandments was built to protect and help govern the nation of Israel. But the nation of Israel was starting to steer away from the Ten Commandments. 
they were starting to steer away from God's word and go into these other religions that involved worshiping idols, that involved uh, the worshiping of self, the worshiping of false gods, and what have you. So God called Jeremiah into the ministry to say, your ministry is going to be this, Jeremiah. You are going to take the word and preach to the nation of Israel to come back to God, to come back to the word, to come back to where they came from and remember who God is. Jeremiah chapter 2 covers God's pleading with the nation of Israel. Okay, this is where we're going to start. This is to give you a background. God sees what is going on. How many of you believe that you could get away with sin? Stupid question? Not really that stupid because many people live like they can and do get away with it. Credit card is probably one of the worst things you could ever have. You use it, use it, use it until you max it out, then you have to pay it back with interest, right? And it goes against you in your credit history, your credit rating. It hurts you when you try to borrow money, it hurts you when you try to get a loan. It's easy to get the money now, but you gotta pay it later, right? Well, sin is that way. You think you may be getting away with your sin, but eventually it will come and root its head and you will pay for it later on. See, that's the kind of attitude the nation of Israel had. Listen, we know He's our God and we know we've been free from the tyranny of Egypt, but we have the right and we have the right to choose what we want to do. And of course, that's where the devil gets us. Listen to what, what, the, what Jeremiah says to the people in verse 13. He said, number one, you change God for gods. That's what he said in verse 11. Now, in verse 13, he says, for my people. And notice how God, in verse 13, says, for my people. Even though the nation of Israel has strayed away, even though the nation of Israel went off into sin, they're still God's people. We are all saved sinners. And I, I don't think people understand what that means. That means it says is that we are saved by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. But we're still are in we live in an imperfect world, in imperfect bodies, in imperfect minds, imperfect emotions. Everything about us is imperfect. It's not holy, it's not right. Okay? God understands that part. Because he created us, he knows everything. God knows everything. But he gave us something for us to be governed by, to be controlled by, and that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit should control our mind, our heart, everything, to be governed by God. One of the dangers is this, is that we can quench the Spirit of God by not following what God has in, ter in, in term for us to follow, which is his word. But that doesn't mean you have stopped being God's people. The nation of Israel has, is, is not gone from being from God. It's still God's chosen nation. And a lot of people make the mistake, well, Israel has done this and they've done that and they're no, long, they're no longer God's people. That's not so. God still owns them. That's their nation. So when you read in Jeremiah 2.13, For my people have committed two evils, two sins. And listen to what they are. Number one, they have forsaken God, the fountain of living waters. Number two, they have hewn, H-E-W-E-D, hewed, excuse me, them out cisterns. Cisterns were like bottles, like big vases. They look like big vases. And they would store their milk, their water, whatever in them for long trips. These were usually waterproof. They were made of goat skin. Uh, they were held, they were held uh, made out of a certain gourd. You remember, you know what gourds are? These gourds were cut out and they were like very waterproof, very stable, very, very solid. They were cut out cisterns and these were broken cisterns that could hold no water. So that was the second thing against them. So the nation of Israel committed two sins. Number one, they forgot, they have forsaken the fountain of living waters, which is God himself. They forgot God, basically. They turned their back on God. And number two, if you turn your back on God, that means you're facing someone or something else, right? When you turn your back on somebody or something, you're facing something else. Well, they were facing their own cisterns. They were carving out a new way, a new path, a new belief. But look at verse 13. It's broken. And since it's broken, it could hold no water. 
-hmm. When you go to a store and you buy a pitcher for your tea, your milk, your water, and if there's a crack in it and it leaks, is that pitcher really any use? No. Well, you can put tape on it. You can put duct tape on it. Duct tape solves everything, right? Do you really want duct tape on your pitcher and you want to serve it out to your family or your guest? That's so ghetto, right? They're probably going to say, why don't you buy another pitcher, right? Well, here's the thing. Do you think God will leave us broken if he could fix us? What kind of God is it that would allow us to stay broken if he could fix us in the first place? Do you, if you have something that's broken, would you try to fix it? Of course you would. Especially if you bought it or if someone gave it to you, you would want to keep it and if it's broken, you would try to find a way to break, uh, fix it. If you can't fix it, you would find someone else that can fix it. Like a ring, you go to a jeweler, right, for a ring? To resize it or whatever. You, nice car, you go to someone that can fix it. In other words, if it's yours, you're going to try to make an effort to fix it. What God was saying was this, you're, you're thinking you're, you're creating a new way, but you're still broken. You could hold no water. So if you can hold no water, what value of you really are? What good is a broken car? What good is a broken washing machine? What, what good's good of it if it's still broken? If you can't use it, what good is it, right? Well, see, that's what God was telling the nation of Israel. If you are broken, how can you be used of God if you're still broken? How can you be used of God if you're still sick? Remember, God is our great healer, right? He's the great physician. God heals people. God, God heals people and makes them whole. You remember, you remember Isaiah chapter 53? By his stripes we are healed, Isaiah 53, 5. Amen. He bore our sicknesses. He bore our griefs on the cross. If you have an opportunity to be healed, if you have an opportunity to be fixed, then why aren't you taking the opportunity to get fixed and healed, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So Jeremiah is saying to the nation of Israel, if you are sick, if you are broken, how come you're not going back to, your, to the original God that brought you out of Egypt, that took you through the Red Sea, that fed you with manna from heaven, that did all these miracles in front of you, why are you so stubborn and not wanting to go back to God to be fixed and healed, right? Right. Here's why. It's three letters into one little word, but it has a great impact. It's called sin. Here's the trick of what, what society is today. Society wants a quick fix, a quick answer that will benefit them in the short term. God is not into quick fixes. When He blesses you, it's forever. When He heals you, it's forever. Amen? When He fixes you, it's forever. It is a process. It's not something that's quick. A lot of people think that the healing of God is quick. The healing of God takes time. The healing of God goes through stages. You ask anyone that has been healed by God, were they healed in a second? No. It took time for the healing to come through. God's healing for you is a permanent healing, but it is a process. And see, the nation of Israel forgot this fact. They forgot the fact that following God is not a part-time thing. Following God is everything. And when they find their own way and they say, you know what, I want to, here's a better way to do this. And I'm going to make a better way. Look how what God compares it to you are still broken. If you try to do, if you try to fix it yourself, you're still going to be broken. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people don't understand that. Well, Pastor, I did this, 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 and this. What's wrong? There's your problem. You did this. You did this. You did this. What did God do? That's the first thing I would ask him if I was counseling. Pastor, I'm broken. I did this. 
What did God do? If you're going to be healed, God has to do it. If you're going to be fixed, God must, God is the instigator. He's the one that authorizes it. When it's out of our hands, and we know it's out of our hands, and when we come to God on, on His terms, then it will be fixed. But see, we have to come to God on His terms. Let's look at this here. We have the notes here. First thing we're going to look at is the two roots of sin. Forsaking the waters of living, uh, of living water, in other words, forgetting God. And number two, cutting out your own cisterns. In other words, making your own way. Number two, verse 19. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that my fear is not in thee. Say it the Lord God of hosts. Let me read that again. Jeremiah 2.19 Your own wickedness shall correct you. Prepare will scratch in their heads. What do you mean by that? We'll get into that. Your backslidings shall reprove you. You know what the word reprove means? You ready for this? Do you study etymology? Etymology is the study of picture words. God is showing you a picture. The word reprove. When you reprove something, your backslidings will reprove you. What does that mean? That means you're going to make a U-turn. The word reprove means you. That means you started on a course, but then you go back to where you came from. So if you're backsliding away from God, if you're going away from God, away from Him, eventually there's going to be a process where you're going to go back to Him. That's called a reprove. And if you actually look, look how the word reprove uh, is spelled, the word prove, it has a U in it in the Hebrew language. And the reason it has a are you all learning this? The reason it has a U in it is because it, the letter U shows the word reprove. If, you, if you're backsliding, you went away from God, but now you're coming back to God. You went down, but now you're on your way up again. That's what the word reprove means. When you reprove somebody, you are correcting the course they're on. In other words, you're bringing them back to God. How many of us this evening need to go back to God? How many of us this evening are going away from God and need to be reproved to need to be steered back to Him? The problem is this. God has said this. It is an evil thing and bitter that you have forsaken the Lord, verse 19, and that my fear is not in you anymore. Now, what does the word fear mean? Now, this, before you get on a tangent and saying, wait, are we supposed to be scared of God? Yes. There's supposed to be a godly fear of Him because of who He is and the power that He has. But if you have a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, you have a different kind of fear for Him, and that's the fear of respect. That's the fear of honor. Everything that you say and do, you will honor Him. So when you honor God and respect Him, that is showing the godly fear. And see, for the nation of Israel, they lost that. How did they lose it? When you forget God, you forget His fear. You don't fear Him anymore. You don't respect Him. You don't honor Him. The connection that you have with God is broken because of your forsakenness. In other words, when you turn your back on God, you, you have damaged that connection with God. You have damaged that relationship with God through basically ignoring it. 
you remember last week we brought up the examples of this? And I want to go back to this because we need to go back to it. You remember the pill that we talked about? For those that watched last week, if you were to give it a magic pill that would cure all your ailments, all your diseases, that you would never gain weight, that you would have the perfect body, that you would not be sick ever again, would you take that pill in an instant? If someone gave you a PIN number to have access to all the money that you could ever need and want, would you take that? If someone gave you a key to, to open any car and have any car you want, would you take that key? But when it came to the book, if, if you were to be given a book that would answer all your problems in life and society, that would answer every question about everything in your life, would you take that book? But then I would have to tell you the same, or there's a catch with you have to read it and understand it. Of those four things, what do you think is the one thing that the people will not do or take? It's the book, because you have to read it and you have to study it. But which one of those four things is reality? It's for real. Is the pill for real? No. Is the pen number for real? No. Is that magic key for real? No. But I would, the only thing that is left that is real is God's Word. God's Word has the answer for every question in your life. It has the answer for every question that you have, not only in this life, but in the life to come in heaven. This is the book that is real. But I would dare say, this would be the last selection that people would take. Do you know how blessed we are to have the Bible in this country? Do you know in other countries, if you're in possession of the Bible, you could be put to death? If you're in possession of the Bible, you could be thrown in jail? If you have possession of the Bible, they can take away your property? In other countries, the Bible is actually banned. If they find you with the Bible, you are, you are subject to persecution or even death. We're talking in the Middle East, the Bible's hated. You go to China, the only way people can have Bibles is through the underground. Russia, if you have a Bible, you face the death penalty. Just by having the Bible, what makes the Bible so hated? Why are so many nations fearing the Word of God? Because it is the Word of God. We live in the United States of America, and we have the Bible, we have access to it almost anywhere. But how many of us actually take the time and actually look at this precious book of God's Word? We have the Bible right now. But in the next few years coming up, the Bible will be under attack by our nation. Here's how. They have already thrown the Bible out of our schools. The Pledge of Allegiance is under attack because of two words under God. Our courts used to have the Ten Commandments. Now they are being taken away. God, the godly influence in, in football games, remember when I, when, when I was there, people would pray before a football game. They don't anymore. People don't want to even salute the United States flag. They would rather burn it and travel it. We had a, a famous lady that came on TV. She was a, a veteran. And she was arrested by police because she wanted to stop this demonstration of people walking on the flag. And she got arrested. This nation is screwed up. Everything is backwards. Right? Did you ever have a diary? Remember that? Remember those days of the diary when you kept there all your thoughts and dreams and fantasies in this little diary of this book? And Simeon had a key in it and you would lock it that nobody would read it. And you would get, people would get so mad once they found out they had a diary and they would read it. How would that person feel? They would feel violated and betrayed. Oh, how dare you read? Now you go to Facebook and you know everything, right? They lay it out there. People get mad at you if you don't read what they post. Or am I wrong? Did you read that in my Facebook about, no. Well, why didn't you? I, I'm sorry. We're so open in our society. We're open with our opinions. We're open with our past. We're open with everything. We open our bodies. We open our minds. We open everything. Everything is so darn open. But when it comes to God, that's when the door shuts. That's when we keep quiet. And that's when we don't say a word. You think Jesus would do that for us? you think Jesus would turn his back on us? Do you think Jesus would say, I have nothing to say to you? You know what should really break your heart is all those people that betrayed Jesus. 
all those people that heard Jesus and did nothing. The rich young ruler who would not give up his riches to follow Christ, he went away. Judas Iscariot who betrayed Christ with a, with a kiss. Peter who denied him three times. All the disciples at the cross of Christ, who was the only disciple that was there, which was the youngest one, John. Jesus is there for us. Are we there for Jesus? That should be the question. How can I be there for Jesus? How can I do that? Well, here's how you can do it. First of all, you have to stand your ground and fight the fight of faith. That means that you have to stand for Jesus no matter what. You have to stand for Jesus when it's uh, not politically correct. You have to stand for Jesus when you're alone. You have to stand for Jesus when everything and everyone's against you. Jesus is going to be the deciding factor in everyone's life. When you follow Jesus, you will leave those some people behind in your life. They will not want to be with you. They, want, they won't follow you. They won't have nothing to do with you because you're with Jesus. And we have to be ready to accept the fact that not everyone's going to love us or not everyone wants to be our friend because of Jesus. Amen? When we pick Jesus, that means we pick against the devil. If we pick against the devil, then we pick against the devil's people. Does that make sense? We, we do not, we stop hanging around his children. We stop following his ways. We stop being worldly. When we follow Jesus, folks, we are different people. We follow the Lord God Almighty. We follow his commandments and we follow his word. We follow his spirit. We are supposed to be different people. We are not supposed to be part-time Christians. Part-time Christians do not go to heaven. It's not hard shoes, okay? Hard shoes counts. This is not hard shoes. You're either saved or you're not. You're either a believer or you're not. You're either full of grace or you're full of something else. You either love God or you don't love Him. Not a lot of people are going to be raptured. Get ready for this. There's going to be a lot of people left behind because they are not the real thing. But what if I love God 50%? You will not be raptured. Well, how can you say that? How dare you say that? Jesus said to Himself, Love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. All is an inclusive word. That means more than 100%. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, you either love me or you hate me. There's no middle ground. A lot of people are going to be left behind, folks. And you think this is a joke. It's not a joke. Read Matthew 7, 14. You have the broad way and you have the what? The narrow way small, constrictive way. Why did Jesus teach that? Here's why. Because a lot of people that think they're going to heaven are not going to heaven. And the few people that actually stand for Jesus and convert and change their lives will get there. See, that's why Jeremiah is preaching in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. He's saying, you have forgotten who God is, the fountain of living waters, and you've gone another path. And God sees that, and God knows that, and God laughs at that. You go in another way, which leads to nowhere. Let's look at your notes. Forsaken the waters, the living waters. Let's go to John 4, 14 and John 7, 38. Let's look at what John has to say. John 4, 14, John chapter 4, verse 14, and then... John chapter 7, verse 38. 414 says this. You ready for this? Let me go back here to verse 13. You remember, you remember uh, the woman over there by Samaria of Jacob's well? And she went there to gather water at Jacob's well all the time for her family to drink. Jesus witnessed to her and said, Listen, woman, why are you drinking this water? The water I'm going to give you, you will never thirst, you will never thirst again once you drink of this water. Jesus said in verse 13, Jesus answered and said, Unto her, whosoever drink of this water from the well is going to thirst again. But whosoever shall drink of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a, a well of water springing up into everlasting life, Jesus said. Here's the difference between the world and God. You ready for it? The answer is found in verses 13 and 14. 
The water that you drink from